Introduction to the evaluation of oil and gas assets. What we're going to be going through today, this is, as I said yesterday, this is a really a five-day course that our company puts on that's been heavily condensed due to the time constraints this week. Um, there's a couple of caveats that we wanted to, that I'd like to make clear. Um, the course that we teach is called Evaluation of Canadian Oil and Gas Assets, so some of the slides are specifically tailored to Canada, and you'll see that as we go through. But the basic fundamentals and principles are applicable worldwide. Um, so the course is really to explain the foundational components uh, for financial evaluation of oil and gas and to understand how to use evaluations. So we'll talk a little bit tomorrow about uses of evaluations after you've seen what goes into an evaluation. So the various modules, so this is the full course, we won't be going through all of this. Um, we talked about petroleum geology and geophysics, we, we don't spend a lot of time on that. Um, we will talk a bit about geology when we're talking about volumetric estimation. Um, I won't be going into probabilistic methods. What I will be focusing on is the estimating reserves portion. So that's that's the main module that I'm going to be going through today. Um, and like I said, most of the, the rest of it goes into the economic evaluation of oil and gas assets. So capital and operating costs, product prices, time value of money and discounting, profitability indices, interest, income taxes, resource and reserves definitions. So you've seen pieces of this throughout the last three days. Um, we haven't spent a lot of time on some of them, but we've gone very in depth into the ones that are likely most important for what you need to make a decision on your um, classification and regulatory requirements. To start out with, um, just a high level overview of evaluations. So they, they require the estimation of future income over time, uh, and then they're discounted back to present day dollars. Once we get through most of this, you're going to understand the appropriate methodology for evaluating oil and gas properties and, and the different methods we use to estimate reserves volumes. Um, you'll understand a little bit more about the characteristics of oil and gas properties. Uh, to start out with, I'm going to be talking about industry units and, and what sort of um, standards you're going to see in evaluation reports. And like I mentioned, I'm going to go a little bit into Alberta's industry. And uh, its size and how it stacks up. You've got a pretty clear idea of what an oil and gas property is. We've gone through project definitions, we've gone through oil and gas activities. The very beginning of this presentation is methods for evaluating assets and, and which one is chosen for oil and gas and why. We talked about the definitions of reserves. I'm going to be going into industry units and Alberta's oil and gas. So what is an oil and gas property? Uh, it requires the ownership of the mineral rights to extract oil and gas and to receive a share, or to receive a share uh, of oil and gas produced by others. So that's working interest versus royalty interest. It's associated with mineral leases, hydrocarbon resources, reserves production, and capital facilities. Oil and gas, it's a, it's a capital asset industry with long-term benefits. Uh, it takes a long time to produce oil and gas. So if you, if you were to lump evaluation of any type of asset, not just oil and gas, into um, into three basic methods. They would be comparable sales, replacement cost, and income approach. All of them are used for certain parts within the oil and gas industry. Uh, only one of them is used for the actual evaluation of oil and gas assets. Pretty much every approach is deterministic. So we've talked a bit about probabilistic approaches versus deterministic. Um, you will mostly see deterministic approaches where you have discrete values and outputs. Um, the vast majority of everything you'll see will be deterministic unless you have very little data. So I'm going to run through these pretty quick. Um, comparable sales, you're basically just comparing to other assets in order to value your asset. Um, things like real estate where it's really based on, um, it's based on analogs near you and, and not necessarily the value of your actual asset, it's more about um, the value of similar assets around you. We don't generally use this in oil and gas properties because properties are so unique and assets are so unique in oil and gas. Um, we do use analogs as a as a performance or as a method for um, determining the performance of certain wells that we don't have a lot of data on, but we don't use it overall. We wouldn't, we wouldn't take the evaluation of uh, one company's property 
and take the value from that and apply it directly to another company's property. Uh, we, we, would, we would do an evaluation of the assets of each. So we, we aren't really using a comparable sales approach for oil and gas evaluations. The second type is replacement cost, and this is just saying, this is where you value uh, an asset at, at the cost of replacing it. Again, it doesn't really work for uh, oil and gas property evaluations. It works for some assets in oil and gas. So this is where you get into uh, salvage values of items in, in oil fields where they can recoup a portion of the cost, and that's where you, how you really value the asset of a specific. Or, sorry, about how you value a specific asset. Um, but again, it's not really applicable to properly property level oil and gas evaluations. The final one is the income approach. So this is the one we do use for oil and gas evaluations where we forecast future cash flows. Then we discount it to a present value. We'll talk a little bit later about why we use the income approach, but the income approach basically, the premise of the income approach is that the value of an asset is proportional to the cash flow it can generate. So that's exactly what this says. Uh, the income approach assumes that the value of an asset is proportional to its ability to generate income, and money now is worth more than money tomorrow. Um, so that's talking about forecasting future revenue and then discounting it back to present day values. So in other words, size matter and time matters. How do we do the? How do we walk through the income approach? We start by estimating the future gross revenue, which is product time, times price. Um, so going into a little more detail, what we're going to be talking about today mostly is the product side. Uh, you have to start with the oil and gas reserves volumes or resource volumes. You start with the in-place volumes. You determine how much you can extract and then that becomes your product. And then you multiply that by the price to get your gross revenue. Then you start working on the deductions, what comes out of it. You start estimating net operating income by deducting operating costs, royalties, capital costs, etc. Um, overrides to partners, so gross overriding royalties. So you're basically removing burdens from the income. And then you calculate your before tax cash flow. I did say capital costs isn't part of step two. Capital cost is one of the last ones that comes out. So to determine your net operating income, it doesn't it doesn't deduct capital costs before you get your net operating income. That's how you get your before tax cash flow. Uh, so before tax cash flow, sometimes you'll see it just abbreviated as BTCF. Uh, it's just your net operating income less your capital costs. And then the final step, uh, if you're in a jurisdiction where you're subject to tax, you will determine your after tax cash flow by removing your uh, income tax. The high level comment, um, evaluations are only as good as their inputs. So if you have poor data, if you have poor procedures, or um, you have un unskilled evaluators, um, the end result is, is usually going not going to be very good. We talk a lot about this. Reserves, petroleum recovered commercially from known accumulations and petroleum is oil and gas and related substances. So oil field units versus metric units. Um, the oil field doesn't necessarily choose imperial or metric. Um, there, there's a mixture of both in, in standards. Um, most oil field units are imperial. So you will see most disclosure to be imperial. Metric units are usually used for government disclosure uh, in certain parts of the world. Uh, and in the US, all work down there is done in, in oil field, which is mostly imperial units. So the standard unit for oil is the barrel. So one barrel is equivalent to 159 liters in the metric system, uh, 42 United States gallons. And the conversion to a cubic meter is 6.29. So that number gets used a lot in evaluations. The standard barrel is included at standard pressure and temperature, which is atmospheric pressure and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. In the metric system, a standard cubic meter is measured at 15 C and atmospheric pressure. So if we look at, uh, at the volumes, you'll see in oil and gas reports and disclosures by companies, um, you got barrels, thousands of barrels, millions of barrels, and billions of barrels. Um, there's a bit of an issue in industry accountants. When they say M dollars, uh, they usually mean millions of dollars, whereas when we say M dollars, we usually mean thousands of dollars. Um, so an M in an engineering report means times a thousand, and an M in an accounting report usually stands for millions. 
the metric units, um, meters cubed, E3 M3s or 10 to the third M3s, etc. It gives you uh, uh, a little bit of an idea of where you're going to see the various levels. So individual wells, you'll see barrels per day or, or barrels produced. Uh, thousands of barrels, that's usually when you're talking about remaining reserves on wells, and sometimes fields. Uh, millions of barrels, that's when you're getting into company level reserves and resources, and billions of barrels is when you're talking about countries and, and very large accumulations. So oil gravity, uh, it's generally referred to as degrees API or degrees. API stands for the American Petroleum Institute, uh, and APBI is an inverse relationship to specific gravity. So the higher the gravity, the lighter the oil. Um, so light oil has high degrees, so light oil 33, 34, uh, there's a lot of 40 degree API oil in Canada. Uh, medium oil 22 to 33 degrees, heavy oil 10 to 22 degrees, and then bitumen would fall somewhere sub 10. Why that's important, the degree API really determines the quality of the product, the lighter the oil, the higher the pricing. There's also um, certain markets demand certain products, so if you were looking at the Gulf Coast or South America, they have a heavy demand for, uh, for heavy oil products to use in their refining process, so there's a, there's a high demand for heavy oil uh, off the coast of Mexico, whereas in Canada, there's limited use for heavy oil, so there's a high discount to heavy oil pricing. So it depends on what the market in the world and what they're using the products for uh, determines the demand for the various types of products and degrees of API. So moving into gas, uh, the imperial unit for gas is the standard cubic foot. You'll see that it's SCFs all the time. It's measured at 14.65 degrees PSI atmospheric and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The metric equivalent is the cubic meter. It's measured at 101 kPa and 15 degrees Celsius. The conditions are not equivalent, which um, matters more for gas than it does for liquid. So it's just saying that even if you have the exact same volume of gas, if you were to disclose it as standard cubic feet, you would end up with a different conversion factor if you were trying to get it into uh, standard cubic meters. When we're talking about gas, uh, standard cubic foot is a tiny amount of gas and a cubic meter is a tiny amount of gas, so you, you will not see much for SCFs or M3s in gas disclosure. You're going to see, uh, similar to oil, you're going to see 1,000 cubic feet. So well rates are usually going to be an MCF per day. Well reserves are usually going to be in millions of cubic feet or sometimes billions of cubic feet. Um, so some of the larger shale gas wells are, are going to recover 8 to 10 BCF. Um, so some of the larger wells get into the billions of cubic feet, so it can be company reserves or large wells. Uh, and trillion of cubic feet, it says country reserves, but when you're talking resources, um, if you were to look at the shale gas plays in Canada and the U.S., uh, companies alone will have TCF of resources in place. So energy units, we, is, we had a question about this on the first day, so you're generally going to see British thermal units when you're talking gas energy, so this is talking about what kind of sales prices you're going to get for gas. Um, a BTU, a British thermal unit, is defined as the heat needed to raise the temperature of one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. Millions of British thermal units is, is what you're usually going to see in terms of sales quantities, um, and they are the metric equivalent or the uh, uh, standard metric unit is the gigajoule, which is equivalent to about 0.95 million BTUs. So in order to convert volumes, so when we do reserves volumes, um, we're forecasting obviously volumes of gas, and in order to convert that to a saleable product, we have to take into account the heat content of the gas. Uh, so you need to know the gas composition to understand the heat content of the gas, but there are some general rough guidelines. So one standard cubic foot is equivalent to about one thousand British thermal units, and one MCF is equivalent to about one mm BTU. So if your heat, heat content is a thousand SCF per BTU, these are true. 
and heat contents to give you an idea in industry they usually range from the lowest you're going to see is maybe 850 or 900 SCF MMBTU, and the highest you're going to see is about 1250 or 1300 MMBTU for SCF, SCF for MMBTU, sir. Um, but this is saying generally if you use the one to one conversion, you're going to be within plus or minus 5% for the vast majority of oil and gas assets, and that's, that's still generally true today. But you do have to be careful. If you're looking at very rich gas or very lean gas, uh, you'll need to make an adjustment. So getting a little bit into Alberta. Um, these are a couple years old, these production metrics, but they still will be in, in the general bar, ballpark of what it is today. Conventional oil, just shy of 600,000 barrels of oil per day. Um, that's up almost 25% from 2010, so we've been seeing a, a large increase in, in our volume since we've unlocked some of the tighter oil and gas formations in Canada. There's a little over 40,000 wells, 40,000 oil wells. We're still talking just about oil with an average rate of 14 barrels of oil per day. So we have a lot of wells and a lot of low rate wells. So 80% of those 40,000 wells in Alberta produce less than 20 barrels a day. So that, that's a relatively modest rate for an oil and gas well. The average rate of that 80% is only seven barrels a day. And the, those 80% of the wells in Alberta account for 37% of conventional oil production. So this is getting back to the 80-20 rule where 20% um, of the wells in Alberta, if you were to inverse this, only, only a fifth of the wells in Alberta account for about 65-66% of um, the oil and gas production. So it's really a small subset of a very large group that's really driving production performance in Alberta's oil and gas industry. So this is getting back into the 80-20 rule. And again, this is, this is the 80-20 rule where your most material assets are a small subset of your total asset base is consistently true in the oil and gas industry. So a graphical representation of all the wells in, in Alberta, again, as of 2014, you get the number of wells on the left, you can see, so this is in cubes per day. So between zero and, and six barrels a day, we have, 20,000 wells in Alberta. So we have 20,000 wells that are very, very low rate. Um, so this is really just showing you the distribution. If you were worried about the materiality of an evaluation of Alberta, the only wells you would really need to worry about are the eight or 10,000 wells on this end of the spectrum. So taking a look at the most productive Canadian oil well. So this is, uh, this is a plot from an offshore field on Eastern, in Eastern Canada. And these rates are in thousands of barrels a day. So there's there's 10 or 11 wells in this field, and you can see they were north of 140,000 barrels a day between the 10 wells. Um, so this again, you you have 20,000 wells that were doing six barrels per day or less. This 10 or 11 wells is producing as much as those 20,000 wells. Moving on to gas. Uh, so the average rate uh, in Alberta is 9.2 BCF per day, so billion cubic feet per day. There's 104,000 gas wells. The average rate of those gas wells is 88 MCF per day, which is still a, a relatively low, modest number. Uh, to give you a sense of how low 88 MCF per day is, when you're looking at the new unconventional wells, they will often come on production at 10 to 15,000 MCF per day for a single well. Um, that 88 MCF per day is going to be close to the economic limit of a lot of those big wells. So it's, it's close to the very tail end of production for most of the new wells that are coming on in Alberta. And 80% of the wells in Alberta produce less than 115 MCF per day. Um, the average rate of those wells, 35 MCF per day and they generate about half of Alberta's production. The bottom slide is just showing you that a very small percentage of the wells produce um, more than 2.4 million cubic feet a day, and they're responsible for more than 20%, more than a fifth of Alberta's total production. So again, a small number of wells is responsible for a large portion of the asset base. Here's the same plot for gas wells. Uh, the volumes are in E3, M3, so you have to multiply by 35 to get it into cubic feet. So you can see wells between 0 and 35 
thousand cubic feet per day. There's almost seventy thousand of the hundred thousand gas wells are in that very low rate of boat production. We've talked a bit about, quite a bit about CBM. All of the CBM wells, or virtually all the CBM wells in Alberta, are going to be in this group. And so, the CBM in in Alberta is not it's not a traditional coal bed methane. It, they're not as prolific. They're usually very low rate, shallow gas wells. Um, the reason there are so many of them in Alberta is because they can drill them very quickly, very efficiently, and very um, with very little capital, and they're very efficient to operate. So even at relatively low rates, you can you can make a decent profit margin on the production in Alberta. So just some high level numbers: uh, world oil production as of 2014 was just shy of 100 million barrels of oil per day. The demand at that time was uh, 94.5 million barrels of oil per day. Canadian oil reserves, uh, 196 billion barrels, of which 177 is bitumen. So that's when I was telling you that uh, Canadian resources are really dominated by bitumen in the oil sands. Remaining oil reserves, so this, this initial oil reserves would be the original, uh, it's not the original oil in place, it's the original oil reserves. So it's still the recoverable volume. Um, but it's not net of production. So if you look at the volume net of production, so remaining oil reserves, we have 168 billion barrels, and 99% of those are bitumen. The average daily rate of an Alberta oil well is only 14 barrels of oil per day. The daily rate of the most productive well is 33,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, and the average daily rate of a gas well is 88 MCF per day.